we also have Karen Fee, uh, uh, which is today, uh, our team, and um, they will be talking, well, I'll let them introduce what they're going to talk about today, uh, back projects and so forth, and we also have Sonia Sita as well. And so they're going to come up, we'll do about 10 minutes each, I guess, and, um, and then they can ask questions. Yeah, is that okay? Cool. All right, thank you. Sorry, I apologise. I'm going to grab someone who will help moderate. I'm going to put my timer on. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Do you want me to do it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Great. Right, okay. Just let, let me know when I'm approaching 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, don't want to speak with these guys. Leave them with no time. Hello. <laughs> so, us are here to talk to you about the challenges of reporting overseas. So it's reporting out of your own context, that would apply to me and Harry, see to slightly different. She's actually reporting in her own context, whereas the, a lot of the reporters that cover South Sudan are reporting out of their context. So um, I've been um, travelling out to um, Gaza, the West Bank in Israel for about 12 years now. So I've been going out since 2001 and 2002, longer than that now. Um, and most of that time, I've been operating in the ground as sort of a human rights worker or helping out with this or that um, organisation. So I've very much been embedded doing things, and that's been my focus. I might come home and do some report backs or do some interviews, but I'm very much kind of just trying to help um, physically on the ground. And the last few years, I've become a journalist. Um, I write for the like daily blog, I've written a book, and I sort of do various articles here, here, there, and everywhere. And so last summer, um, when Operation Protective Edge happened, um, I was sitting at home watching the reporting of this absolute hideous assault. You have Israel, which is one of the world's foremost military powers. It has you know, one of the most supreme air forces, land forces, sea forces, on it. They're one of the best of the militaries. Um, firing pretty much most of its arsenal, bar nuclear, upon a tiny strip of land called the Gaza Strip, which is surrounded by an eight metre high wall, which Israel controls. And they have 1.8 million people trapped behind this wall. They can't escape by sea, they can't escape by air, they can't get through. They are trapped. One million of those people are under the age of 18. I don't know <laughs> if I could find a more perfect example outside of the Warsaw Ghetto of World War II of a clear massacre. These people have no army, no air force. Their only defence is some tin pot rockets that they can some, sometimes get over the walls in like putative self-defence. And this was reported as a war on the BBC, on CNN, in The Guardian, which, whichever mainstream media source you would elect to access, this was reported as a war. In what kind of insane world would you describe this as a war or even a conflict? This is an outright massacre. These people have already been ethnically cleansed into this Gaza Strip in the first place, from 1948 onwards and now they continue to be pounding. So I was pretty furious watching the news reporting. So I set up a crowdfund and people actually donated. I said, I will go. I will go over to Gaza and I will report this live every night at 8 pm on across the internet. But I need you to invest and get me there. So people did. We raised a few thousand pounds, got them there with the equipment necessary, and I made it into Gaza and I reported Operation Protected Edge from there. And what I wanted to show people was what was actually happening. To give people a sense of what life is actually like on the ground in Gaza. But not only that, because Channel 4 did quite a good job of showing the fallout. But what was missing from, from the Channel 4 news coverage was any kind of context. So as people would go, and you know, this happened to me several times over, where people would go, it's bloody horrible what's happening to those Palestinians. Awful. If only Hamas would stop firing those rockets. You know, and you go, that's the most absurd thing. Can you imagine World War II reporting on the Warsaw Ghetto being cleansed? And people going, God, man, 
people are suffering in that Warsaw ghetto, isn't it? If only those Jews would stop stealing food and being Jewish. You know, it's like that level of egregious reporting. So in terms of the challenges of, of doing something like that, the principle of me was not putting anyone in danger by being there. And you can only go so far with that. So I had a handler when I was there, a guy that was driving me around, arranging interviews, that kind of thing, translating Arabic. I'm you know, not an Arabic speaker yet. Um, and his wife at that time was seven months pregnant. And every day he had to travel from Baker here in North of Gaza, pick me up, and we would go out. And you've got my family in the UK bricking it, and you've got his family in Baker here bricking it, all of them terrified. And that was difficult enough. But I think what often happens when Westerners go into a situation like that, and I've certainly been guilty of it in my younger days when I was going out there, is you want to be, there's a kind of macho um, stuff that, that takes over, and certainly some people in, in the international solidarity movement are guilty of this. I've been guilty of this, I'm not pointing fingers, I've done this myself, and people start going, yeah, let's go down, let's go down to Rafa where the action's happening, you know, they get all they think they're really hardcore and tough. And right, let's you know put ourselves at the maximum possible risk. It's really tough. It's like that's not the point. The point, you know, you'll never be a Palestinian. You know, no Westerner, no matter what risk you think you're taking by being in that country, you will never be a Palestinian. So I think the important thing is to just give up the ego about it and give up the kind of superhero complex and actually operate in a way which works in the context that you're in. And some days, that meant for me, I really wanted to go out and put stuff in the ground, and I didn't, because it was too dangerous, and I wasn't willing to put anyone else at risk. I was close enough. Go down when it's a little, a little, a little less hot. And so that was one. And the, the other thing, being aware of your kind of cultural shortcomings, and, and the fact that, you know, there's quite a lot of times where I would actually speak before I issued a report, I would actually speak to people around me about what I was going on. And it's not censorship, it's not going to how I'm right, so not. It's about being privy to things like I wouldn't release people's names that I'd interviewed while we were still there at the time. For a simple reason. A war, you know, this, this massacre was actually happening, it was live as, as we were there. And Israel was actually using Twitter, using social media to target people. So things like saying, oh, I saw some rockets fired off a building, is a really dangerous thing to do in that context because you might as well give Israel a call and say, hi, yeah, I think you might want to target your missiles in this area of town. Because Gaza is so, so close to Nick, you make a mistake like that and it can actually result in, in people literally dying. It can result in a hospital being It can result in someone's home being blown up. So there's a really enormous onus on you when you're reporting in that context to think about every tweet, about every Facebook status update, even down to your location. I wasn't saying where I was. I wasn't saying where I was staying. You know, I was going in and mostly I was reporting a day out and when I would talk to people at the evening, I'd say this is where I've been today, after I've been through, after I've seen things, then you share the footage. But I think that's definitely, you know, definitely there have been problems with Western reporters failing to, to meet those terms. Um, and, you know, to go back to not being a Palestinian, I think being humble is really important. You know, we saw horrible things and you do have your own personal pain to deal with. You know, you're going to get to leave and get to recover from that. You know, we, the hardest day for me, we went to our Shifa hospital um, and, you know, we were working on almost zero sleep. You know, I, I think I'd gone to sleep for about half an hour and I was woken up because one ton whatever had landed about 100 metres from the hotel. And I am in a five-storey hotel and it actually sw swam forward and swam back as if that it was on rubber band. It I mean, it was just like it was on stilts. So I was on <clears throat> I was absolutely terrified. I couldn't get to sleep again after that. And then gunboats pulled up outside the hotel <laughs> on the beach, and they were just strafing the coast. And it's just 
absolutely constant like that all the time. And, and there's a guy called Omar Green, who's, who's a Palestinian journalist who's operating in Gaza, and he issued a tweet which resonated, I think, for anyone who's been in that situation, which is, being in Gaza isn't about death and despair. It's about the knowledge that you could be evaporated any second. And it really made sense of it, is that you imagine people running around, screaming, um, crying, and yes, that does happen. But the real pain of what's going on there is people not being able to plan past five minutes. Don't know, you really don't know if you're gonna be there in five minutes time. You just, your life is measured in seconds and minutes, and you're really not thinking um, much past that. So the kind of questions that you're asking people when you're interviewing them radically change. You know, I went in and I started asking people questions like, well, what do you think about the peace process? You know? Well, do you think two-state solution? <laughs> do you think one-state solution? And you suddenly realise how, excuse the language, fucking ridiculous that question occurs as when you're dealing with someone whose home's just been battered to bits. Their, their home is like rubble. Their kids are dead. They don't even know where their next meal's coming from. And you're talking about some theoretical scenario in the future that they don't even know if they're going to exist in or not. You know? So you change... Thanks. So you do change your journalism. I've radically changed the journalism that I was doing there. It was more about talking to people about how they are right now, how they feel about that. You know, and you have the patience to go, these are the times to ask those questions. These are comfort questions that you ask when you've got some peace and security. They're not questions people can deal with in the trauma that they're in. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. I think it's about, for me, the challenges <coughs> of reporting overseas are being aware of cultural differences, keeping yourself humble all of the time because people do want to go, it's really brave what you're doing, Look, you know, and people do kind of get a bit amped up in that and it's like you're superheroes and you're not, you're a tourist, you know, it's a very grim tourism but you will only be there for a period of time and then you will be able to go home and it will be over for you and it will continue for those people to be coming to really important and knowing what questions it's appropriate to ask and maintaining that sensitivity, knowing that these are people's actual lives. They're actually living this. It's not, you know, a university essay where people are talking about things. So thank you very much. That's me done for now. December 2013. Six days later, the conflict started, the war began. Uh, for those who don't understand the context behind the war, uh, basically the president is from one tribe and then the rebel leader is from another tribe. He was vice president, but then he lost his job in July. So um, the president accused him of um, trying to overtake, like, accused him of um, a coup attempt. And then obviously um, the rebel leader said he was chased out of the capital city Juba and um, presidential guards were fighting as well as people from his tribal group Nuer were being killed during that time. So I was there during that time and uh, the family wanted me to come back to the UK and things like that, but I, I refused, I just stayed. I stayed until the 27th of December 2013 and I went to Kenya and I was just continuously reporting the news that was going on over there. So um, obviously because it's a new conflict, it's a new country from the 2011, and um, journalists were coming into the country, seeing, okay, there's this new war going on, so um, what's happening? So I've been observing quite a few of them, me and some of my other uh, South Sudanese friends. Um, some of them are journalists themselves, or some of them have media or, or, or that kind of thing. So there were some of them that were reporting wrong information, sensationalizing headlines, saying, okay, you know what, you know what, we are being 
hunted down and killed off in the capital by this president's tribal group. So they were seeing there's a genocide going on. There's a lot of um, bias, especially, you know, as I said before, headlines inciting genocide, tribalism, and the war had just begun. So the journalists came to the country and had known the context behind the fighting, truly <coughs> understanding that the rebel leader was actually sacked from his job in um, June and July 2013. So we would question the authenticity of a lot of these journalists, their impartiality, but we would often be ignored or blocked on social media and sometimes disrespected, and it still happens to this day. So, The Guardian in January uh, 2014 published an article headlined South Sudan State Catholic Party of the Week. The header of that article that was published online said that the author was the first Western journalist in the country. We were on social media campaigning about this. A few of my friends had set up a petition um, asking for the article to be taken down. The Guardian did take it down. And we also stated a petition that we were actually very concerned about international media reporting exclusively on one ethnic group's um, killings. And we also acknowledged that international media can sometimes fuel retaliation and also call for unbiased, unbalanced, we, we called for unbiased, balanced independent reporting. First of all, the, the title first Western um, journalist in anywhere in Africa, is, you know, anywhere in the world actually, could be quite offensive because it contributes to the idea that Western journalism is always put above local journalism. And it also suggests, and it also uh, feeds the misconception that Western journalism is informative, unbiased, and impartial in any sort of sense. And um, South Sudan is a very complex country, has a very complex history. Uh, 64 different tribes, many different languages. And um, therefore, you know, we also demand that local journalists with experience and knowledge of the context of the country to report its news. And so, um, Al Jazeera saw this commotion going on social media, saw that the Guardian article was taken down. They actually did a 20 minute segment on how to report media in a country like South Sudan. They were asking experts about how do you report news in a country where there's just um, a country where illiteracy is really high, but people still listen to news, people still gossip, and then also um, has many unresolved issues and um, a lot of tribalism, but the country is still trying to find the tribalism. And so um, I'll just say that the segment it featured one of my tweets as well as. Um, discussion on The Guardian's um, title and article, and I, I thought that was a really good, um, I thought it was really impressive that we managed, such a small group of us on Twitter, managed to get such attention, especially from some, some leader like Al Jazeera about this, and I cheekily you know, did um, send a link to it to one of the journalists who's so guilty of always reporting news in South Sudan about one tribe versus another tribe, and she obviously kind of ignored it. So, uh, what I want to say is like, therefore, um, media needs to be reported uh, responsibly as uh, sensationalist and biased misinformation can have adverse effects, especially in countries like Sudan, where people just, you know, if there's, if there's an attack, attack on the group of people, there's always reprisals. Like, it's very violent, the social fabric is completely disintegrated. So, um, unfortunately, not much has changed since then. We've been a few weeks ago, there was something in the news about uh, a British aid that was killed. We did a little bit of research, we spoke to some people in Juba, and they said, well, he was an aid worker and he was killed because of a case of um, mistaken identity. Still, they don't want to listen to us. Um, the bigger media, they just don't listen. So some, some, not all of them, some Western journalists continue to report news in a biased situations way, and the stories are still valued over hours, the media houses, registered media houses in, in Juba and around South Sudan. And unless our story is purely negative or um, reports elements of safe mentality or anything that demonizes our government or our people, it's usually not taken seriously. It's not officially valid. This is something I've been really passionate about and still discussing because my media house is at my uh, website is actually registered and we have a huge following of social media. I perhaps the biggest one I've also seen is so it's 15,000 likes on Facebook and we get information from there and we talk to people on the ground, we have family, we just get information straight but then it's still treated like, well, you know, you're from there. 
the Guardian papers or writers or yeah, things are always um, valued and we've always told people that conflict is not as easy as it's, it's not as simplistic as it's reported. So, so yeah, that's all I want to say about my thing. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope that this is not a too repetitious or boring talk. Um, so we were asked to talk about um, the challenges of conflict reporting, uh, particularly in the context in the, in the context of uh, parachute journalism. This idea that uh, dozens or hundreds of journalists will descend on a place to cover a particular conflict at a time of escalation or crisis. Um, and I have some experience with this, so just to quickly let you know uh, my background. Uh, uh, I'm most known for my reporting in the Gaza Strip uh, during, during the war in winter 2012 and the war last summer in 2014. Um, I used to work as an independent and then as a freelancer uh, journalist and documentary filmmaker and now work as a staff correspondent for RT, formerly known as Russia Today. Um, with my own eyes, I've seen um, this phenomenon of parachute uh, journalism and how it works in practice. Not only did I parachute into Gaza last summer, but conversely, previously I had been based in Gaza for several months at the other end of the spectrum. So um, I was able to see the kind of different uh, reportages that you see as a result of, on the one hand, parachuting in, uh, and on the other hand, being uh, embedded there uh, more in a kind of more... Uh, if you like, intimate way with the situation, knowing, having better local knowledge and uh, better connections and etc. And that's something which is really very interesting. Um, one of the, the main takeaways of the issue of parachute journalism is, of course, the way that the corporate media, the dominant media, the mainstream media works, is that obviously you, you have the situation of uh, established senior correspondents parachuting into a situation to cover it at the last minute in the 11th hour, and the people who are most expert in the situation obviously have been born there. Um, so you have this kind of perverse relationship between knowledge um, and uh, uh, well, I've lost my train of thought, but on the one hand, knowledge, and on the other hand, access and the ability to actually communicate. Um, so that's a quite bizarre relationship. On the other hand, a caveat to that, of course, is the ability to go into a situation fresh and communicate it back to a local audience is actually valuable. So just to give you an example, if you imagine you're in the Gaza Strip during wartime, most journalists will stay at one of three hotels, there are several hundred journalists, you have people with different passports, different nationalities, different backgrounds, working for different kinds of outlets, television, press, etc., all communicating in different languages in different ways, with different baggages and different biases. You see um, how people's biases then inform their content, the kind of questions they ask, the kind of reportage they produce, the kind of ways they film their reports. Um, and that's a really interesting uh, takeaway because not only does it show that, of course, people come with biases because you end up with different interview questions and different outputs, um, but also it, it shows, excuse me, I'm almost choking my chewing gum, it shows the, um, <laughs> it shows the kind of, um, almost bizarreness of the whole process, uh, the superficiality of it to an extent. Um, so, another thing I just add to that, um, that, for example, a French journalist knows the French audiences, television audiences, let's say, context and understanding of events, and therefore is better expert at communicating what life might be like in Gaza to someone who's French living in Paris, because they know the communication means. They can uh, use metaphor and analogy, it's like this. You know? So uh, actually there is real social value in having that at the other end of the spectrum. So there are many complex issues involved here. I hope that makes sense. I probably didn't do it very clear what uh, meaning of communicating that. Um, but there are lots of complex issues. Um, parachuting into a, a, a conflict zone. Um, one is obviously trying to communicate a situation um, in, in two different ways. One, you're trying to communicate the hard news of incontestable facts, or in a place like Gaza, everything's contestable, but incontestable facts of how many people have been killed, sorry to say, because the basic information matters. As well as, if you like, softer news, which is the effect of the hard news, the effect of the main headlines of a story. And this is all an art, it's a craft, it's not a science, and that's why you see different kinds <coughs> of reportages and outputs. 
In doing that, in communicating all of that, of course there is the issue of impartiality, balance and bias. I already touched on bias, to then touch on balance and, and, and uh, objectivity and impartiality. Of course, if someone's been killed, they have been killed. You can't be subjective about someone being killed. So, at one end of the spectrum, again, there is such a thing as absolute pure objectivity. At the other end of the spectrum, there isn't, because how then you frame that in context is entirely subjective. Um, and so that's where then reportages begin to differ. Uh, and as I already mentioned, biases then inform uh, those contexts. Now, another thing about uh, contexts is that depending on the format of communication as a storyteller, a journalist, whatever, you know, a columnist, whatever, depending, you know, some, some of the people that uh, they're going to go, go there to be, you know, like cartoons and pictorials, um, so various different uh, sorts of people there. Um, but, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. Trying to communicate context is actually very difficult because so much is happening in the way of hard news that you feel perhaps compelled to communicate. It's very difficult to actually put that in a context. Now, news is news. News is not history. So there's therefore uh, a very difficult relationship between what's happening and the need to communicate what's happening now, what's just happened, and what's happened 100 years ago, which may inform the present. And so this really is not a science. Um, it's more of an art form. Uh, you know, to use rhetorical language. And so that's why, therefore, you see differences in reportage. And that's a, a very important issue. Uh, in a recent talk, I was talking about this issue. You know, uh, for example, the situation in Gaza during uh, a wartime. How often do you, uh, does, the, does the television, the mass media television audience, get reminded of the historical dynamic between the two belligerents in the war? And that's a, that's a key reality. You go to bbc.com. You, know, you click to the, the third level of pages and you get the background uh, context. But the headline at the most elementary level, of course, doesn't convey context. So you end up with the way that people then consume news is that they consume the most superficial first. So you end up, therefore, with really often a lacking uh, impression of context when you uh, consume the news. Just to touch on the issue of uh, objectivity and balance and subjectivity and responsibilities of content, on context, and etc. This is a, a, a very complicated issue, uh, and obviously there are many different theories and you know, ethical uh, perspectives governing this. Um, but uh, one uh, thing which I find quite interesting um, is the, the, the military dynamic between uh, the two belligerents in Gaza and Israel. Um, to, to make it sound like there are two belligerents, one in May, infer from that that the two belligerents are of the same uh, strength and background, etc. Of course, they're not, um, when very rarely uh, we have conventional wars uh, in this day and age, so uh, often it, it's not that case. But what you see in a situation in Gaza is that generally most people, and certainly the messaging from people who have a voice, the people who are uh, elected and etc., the general messaging is that it's a war. So if you go back to last summer, or the previous war in winter 2012, or the previous one in winter 2009, generally people call that a war. In my experience, when you, when you speak to people, you interview them, well, you know, what's happening, etc. The minority of people will call it a massacre. They will use, uh, in a sense, what's rhetorical language in that way. Um, it's a very delicate area. Um, because, for example, many people will believe that if 99% of civilian, 99.5% of civilian casualties are occurring on one side, uh, and the, all of the other civilian casualties are from the other side, obviously that's not balanced. And so, perhaps to use the term "war," I mean, this is elementary language, just to just describe the headline of the situation, without even going into more complex issues about what's happening. It's a very uh, idea of calling to war. Some people will find that misleading because they will say it makes the <coughs> The, it gives the impression that, that the two sides are equal. So at the same time, you want to mislead people about the military dynamic. But at the same time, you have to honor what most people are calling it, for example. I hope that makes sense. So if both sides are actually generally calling it a war, you see there are complex issues involved. So there are no easy answers for any of this. Another issue which is thrown into the challenges of conflict reporting, particularly parachute journalism, is the fact that the situation or the story is developing quicker than you can keep up with it. 
it's also developing quicker than television can keep up with it. And so you have, therefore, an intense set of pressures from physical security to production speed. You're trying to reel stuff out as quickly as possible and communicate what's just happened as quickly as possible trying to distill a massively complicated, nuanced, devastating tragedy, perhaps, into two and a half minutes. Yeah. Not an easy human task. And of course, one will never be able to do that justice. I've had 10 minutes. You tell me to wrap up, yeah? Okay. Um, Another couple uh, of things before I, I leave you in peace. Um, the, the agenda of which wars are covered, which conflicts are covered, which stories within those conflicts are covered, which perspectives are covered, which people are interviewed, all of these things are of course also entirely subjective. And generally speaking, most of the dominant media conforms to particular narratives and perspectives and therefore messages about a conflict pretty much you end up with a uniform uh, communication style of message. And that's not just because the hard facts are the same, that's because within the dominant media sphere, there are systemic um, factors that cause media outlets, let's to give, to give an example, Sky to BBC to Al Jazeera English, etc., roughly the same narrative, the same style of production, uh, and therefore the same impression uh, in news content. Just to give one other thing as well, of course as a result of uh, the, as I said, the intense pressures and uh, circumstances of working in this kind of uh, conflict zone, <coughs> you also end up with incredible inaccuracies being communicated. But as a result of the, the dynamics between particular forces and the, the dominance of a particular narrative over another narrative or impression, some facts will be misreported with ease, and others won't be misreported with ease. So I've also seen in my experience, um, and in some cases, an almost uniform misreporting of a particular situation, um, for example, in Gaza, um, which strikes you as absolutely bizarre. Um, so I hope this helps elucidate some of the challenges about conflict reporting. Thanks. Take it in round two. Um, Just really, really simple question. Um, excuse me? I didn't catch your name, but what, what organisation you're working for? I'd really like to follow uh, it. Talk of Juba. Talk of Juba. Thank you very much indeed. It was a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Uh, you were talking about misrepresenting conflict. I do a lot of work on Iraq. And the story that comes from all of the mainstream media and the Iraqi government is quite the opposite of what is the situation in Iraq. And I wonder if you have any tips on like, how you actually tackle that, because the government were bombing civilians months before ISIS even had a foothold in the country, and that just doesn't get reported. Like, do you have any tips on how we can tackle that? Um, for me, I mean, it, it goes to what Harry was saying about um, the, um, the, the type of reports that you do. So, you know, in terms of the, the sort of what Harry refers to as the hard facts, this many people died, this many places were bombed, this is, this is the kind of the state of things right now. That's like an immediate thing that you can do straight away. But what I also did was film a documentary while I was there, and I wrote articles too. So you then bring those together, and you say, okay, he, here are just the facts, because people do want to know the facts. It's like what is happening right now, you know, people are kind of hungry for that. But um, I didn't ever do one of those without at least framing it a little bit, and I think that's the mistake. I know Harry's saying, you know, you've only got two and a half minutes, and, and that is a different pressure. But I think in that two and a half minutes, most of the mainstream media I was watching did frame it, and they did misframe it. You know, it wasn't that they just didn't frame it. You know, it was very much clear. You know, even from if you would even read a Guardian article that would be talking about the number of people that were killed, the leading image would be a Palestinian with a barcode thrown throwing a stone. So that frames it. You're already looking at this story from a place of, ooh, scary angry Muslims, 
you know, and it, it sort of takes you that way. So I think you can frame these things. So my advice would certainly be, you know, if you're, are you, are you writing? I'm a, we're a campaigning organisation, so we don't specifically work on the conflict. We work on conflict pollution in Iraq. But then, so I'm looking at Iraq and speaking to Iraqis all day, every day, and then seeing yeah. mainstream media, and it's quite a difficult thing to do. Yeah, so, I mean, one way to work it is, is, is bypass them. And I know that's scary because they've got the biggest audience. But you know, if you've got a story that you want to get out, talk to independent media organisations because you know we can get a story viral. Mm. You know, it will be read by millions of people. It's you know you have now these alternative channels that that you can take advantage of, and sometimes those stories then bottom up. You know, so I've, I've had a story in the police last year which no one was picking up from from my source. You know, you want to know about it. It was a Facebook page. It was a secret page that British police officers have been using. That was basically, um, you know, kind of like, oh, remember when we were in training? But actually, they were showing pictures of crimes they committed, of, of like rampant sexism. There was racism on the in this page. You know, I had a, you know, my, my source was on this page. One of the officers that trained for them couldn't get this story out, so he came to me and said, "Well, can you write it up?" So I wrote it up, and all of a sudden, I was getting phone calls from the Times and the Mail Online. Because it had gone viral, and then and now they want a bit of it. So that would be my tip to you: is actually, if you are not getting what you want from the mainstream media, go through back channels, talk to the alternative media. If that then wins, you will then have the mainstream media come along and go, "Oh crap! You know, we want those hits too." So they then want to tell the story, and that's that's one way of doing it. And also thinking about which outlet you use. So I've done this from both sides of the camp as a journalist, but also as a campaigner. Mm. You know, and then you know, you start to know the types of media that really don't work for your story. And so for me, like the BBC London Evening News, never do it. If, <laughs> if you want any nuance, if you want any insight, don't do it. You know, if there's a documentary team that you can find and work with, if you've got a specific journalist that you respect, and you think actually they can, they can take this story on, you know, pitch it, pitch it to the right people. That that would be my two pens Any other questions? I can't say along those lines, but no one else is. Is there a network anywhere where all of the independent alternative media are going, this, this is a good documentary group, these are good people to work to, don't go to the BBC London News. Is, that, is, that, is there, is there a, a, a central site where you guys can draw well, It's funny you should say that, because I know the real media guys who are organising this yeah. are actually working on developing a news aggregator. So I don't know if any of you have a news aggregator, like Feedly or Google News or whatever, so you get all of the little headlines. And actually, they're putting together a news aggregator, but for alternative and independent media, which I think is, is a, one of the most exciting things which has happened um, for independent media in some time. Um, you know, like you know, like you're experiencing, is that actually then you can go, you can set thing up, you've got all your feeds coming in, and then you can start to work on that esteem. But well, actually, that person's done absolutely brilliant work in Iraq. That's who I want. You know, to to come my piece, you can pitch. You know, directly to them, and also, you know, with us guys who are working in the alternative media, you know, it tends to be less formal too. You know, I get people come through my Facebook page. You know, they'll come to the script and my daily Facebook page and go, I've got a story I really want covered. But no one's, you know, and then you get the opportunity to do that. So I would, yeah, keep your eye out for the, the real media news aggregator because that's going to be awesome. Um, other than that, to be honest, we meet up at events, so you know, things like Occupy London. Occupy Democracy, um, UK Uncut, those types of things, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to have a whole bunch of bloggers and independent journalists hang out with those. Don't be put off from coming over and talking to us and saying hello and telling us about the story that you've got because you know that's the way that we work because we want to we want to do that stuff. And it's not about you know corporate media bad, independent media good. But there is some complementary stuff that we can do, and it might be that that space is more appropriate for that.